most kind and gracious Heavenly Father. It is indeed a great joy to be able to come in unto your house this day to gather as a group of thy saints, as a group of thy, your people. I would ask that your spirit may continue to be with us this day as it has been in previous services. That beautiful, gentle spirit. I would ask that your angels may be round about us this day to protect us and guide us and open up our hearts and our minds to be receptive to those words that our brother has pondered upon and fasted and prayed upon, that he may bring forth those things that would challenge us in our daily lives, that would encourage us and inspire us to be those better people, to be a light in a dark world, Be with our friends and our families as they have uh, unable had to have opportunity to be here this day, that a portion of your spirit may go with them as well. And also be with those that have duties elsewhere in different congregations, that your spirit may abide with them as well. And all things may be brought in great praise, honor, and glory unto thee. Be with those that have responsibilities this, this day that they may do it in accordance to thy will, that they may uh, honor their stewardship towards you, and that we may all honor our stewardship in our time and in our talents and in our gifts. I would just ask that you would be with us this day and be with our brother as he breaks the bread of life with us. I ask all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Our kind and most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we have the privilege to be able to gather in a place such as this through the sacrifice and through the uh, givings of those who have gone before, you've prepared the way this day that we can worship. 
And so, Heavenly Father, we recognize that that which we do now is preparing that which you would have in the future. And so we thank thee for the opportunity to give of ourselves, not only of our monies this day, but also, Father, of our talents, our gifts, our time, as we have gathered to this place, that we could be here to commune and to worship thee. We pray that you would bless every heart, those who have given and those who have a desire within to give, that they will be blessed and that they will recognize those opportunities that are before them. We pray that you would continue to bless us and that these monies would be used for your purposes to build up and to edify and to strengthen the building of thy kingdom in this area of your vineyard. We do ask and pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd like to share with you a few words from the Book of Mormon. At the very beginning in chapter 1, verse 1, I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents, therefore I was taught somewhat in all the learning of my father, and having seen many afflictions in the course of my days, nevertheless, having been highly favored of the Lord in all my days, yea, having a great knowledge of the goodness and the mysteries of God. Therefore, I make a record of the proceedings of my day, and I make it in the record of the language of my Father. May God add his blessing to the reading of this word. Thank you. 
I stand before you this morning very humble. As I think about uh, the contributions of uh, my father and my grandfather, the great respect that I have for them and the knowledge that they were faithful enough and strong enough to go through things that I, I couldn't have endured. And I don't know how they, uh, they did it. But they were men of great faith. And my great, my grandfather was in a wheelchair and he had seven kids. And his wife dies of typhoid and there he sits. If he would have died, she'd have got $30 a month. But because he was the man of the house, he got $6 a month. It didn't make any difference whether he was in the wheelchair or not. But I remember my father talking about though they didn't have anything, one of his cousins also had seven children and was evicted. This was during the Depression times. And Grandpa took him in. And it was Christmas time, and he wasn't going to get anything for his kids that the other family didn't get also. So the 50 cents that he had for each of his children became 25 cents, that all might be treated equally, and that all might be treated f fairly. He was a man of integrity, and he uh, emphasized to his children the responsibilities of being honest and upright and being good citizens. And when we talk about, uh, in section 68 of the Doctrine and Covenants, where it talks about our children should, those that have children in Zion should be raised so that by the time they're eight years old, they have an understanding of the resurrection and the understanding of the things of God. It wasn't much past eight years of age that my father was put in an orphanage. And this is where... Uh, my grandfather had to go through something that I, I, I don't know how he did it. The Red Cross came and he was getting worse. And, um, his muscles were getting weaker and weaker. And they talked him into putting the children in the orphanage and that they would keep them all together. My dad still doesn't like the Red Cross to this day because he says as soon as we got in the orphanage, we went every every direction, and if it wasn't for an older sister, they would have never known where each other was. But my grandfather, what we were talking about doing in a few weeks, a slide presentation, they used to do it years ago, sheets, on, and have it all drawn out on the sheets. And the Mormons and the Latter-day Saints, the reorganized church, both came, and he, uh, petitioned the Lord as to what he should do. And he and the older children uh, went down into the waters of baptism. And it wasn't until after I had been married and had come, come to Missouri and gathered that one night and I was sitting in a prayer service and the Spirit came over me so strong, and it said, Your grandfather prayed for your father. And you know, and my father that was farmed out to different farms coming out of the orphanage, basically as common labor. But every place that he went, 
allowed him to go to his church and the, uh, the fact that there was a River Nice church in that community are all things that I think were prayers of answer. From a father who had to do something that I could have never done, give up my children. And I'm thankful that I never had would never have to go through that. And my father grew up through some tough times. I remember him saying, I was starting player for four years in basketball. Nobody ever came to see me once. But the Lord again blessed him. How, uh, without any really training, he never drank, he never smoked, and he never uh, ran around. And the Lord blessed him with a good companion that was very, very supportive. And this is why we tell our children and our grandchildren how important it is to pray that the Lord might direct you. A couple things that I think are very critical is you should have a direction from the Lord who you're to marry. And then one other thing that I think is very important, you need to be with somebody that you can pray with. That is a very crucial thing. Prayer as we talked about in class, is very vital to the growth and the development of a family. I, uh, I remember as a young boy, and I don't know, I suppose mom sent me to the room, or to their bedroom, and I walked in and I saw my father on his knees praying. That really touched me. It had a big impact on my life. And as I grew up and I went with him to World Conference and different activities of the church, I remember coming home and finding him on his knees weeping because of the changes that people were trying to make in the church that he knew were wrong and he knew they were not pleasing in the sight of God and he knew they would affect many people. He had a great love for people. And he went through some very good years with the family. But he had to make some sacrifices. Um, he'd built a new home in Iowa, and he'd been very good in supporting his, his sons because he wanted so much that, a, that we have a business, particularly he would, he would have liked for us all to farm, to be fathers and sons. And uh, the Lord moved upon him that it was time to gather. And there again is the, the faith of a good companion. They built a new house. I don't know as very many women would build a new house and be willing to move away from it. She was always supportive. Well, in the zeal, I guess you'd say, to have the family all gather, uh, he made some moves that we can look back and say were unwise. But who knew then that uh, interest rate was going to jump to 23% and that there was going to be no crops? And that was hard on him. He'd always farmed, he loved nature. He could always take us, us boys and then also with the grandkids. He had a lot of times had a blanket in the tractor or a combine where the little grandchildren could ride with him. And he, he, it tore him up to go to the city to work. He'd never been in that kind of environment, the vulgarity the poor language, shocked at what some of the women were talking about, and uh, it, it was some tough years for him. 
And then mom died in 2000. They'd been married for 52 or three years. And he's been 15 years alone again. You know, that's a pretty poor, in my estimate, a pretty poor beginning and a pretty poor ending to life. And I, I sure, it's hard for me to imagine his loneliness. You know, when it talks about honoring our fathers, you know, today we don't make $3 an hour and a minute on the phone costs us a dollar. Most of us have unlimited phone calls that don't cost us a thing. And yet we don't have the time to call our parents and to tell them thank you or I love them. I call my dad about every day. And I can tell every time that I tell him I love him. And he says it back that there is the surge of unity that he and I have felt over the years. Because when, uh, when he first started coming back to church, I would go with him and just be him and me a lot of times. And we had some great experiences as a father's son. And how important it is that our, our fathers teach our children the ways of God. And that's what Nephi was saying here. I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents, therefore I was taught somewhat in the knowledge and the teachings and of my, my parents. And over the course of time, he came to have a great knowledge of the goodness and the mysteries of God. I submit to you that you don't have a great knowledge of the mysteries of God until you've learned how to worship, until you study the Word, as the Scriptures talk about, feasting upon the Word of Christ and what it brings into our lives. You know, there are many goodly fathers out there. Some of them were in the church and some of them without out of the church. Some of them that don't even know Christ and are goodly parents, goodly fathers. But I submit to you, every one of those that's a goodly parent is practicing spiritual dis discipline, spiritual laws, even if they don't know it. If you have a father that doesn't know the Lord, but he teaches honesty and integrity, uh, not to steal, he might not know God, but he knows the laws of God. And he knows how they're important in the lives of individuals. I've seen families that, uh, I think particularly a family that I've read quite a bit about because they were very successful in the wrestling community. The one son was a four-time national champ. And how that family did things together, as was talked in our class this morning about families being split up. They supported one another. They went to the wrestling deals together. When they got home, they wrestled. And there was a great unity. There was, I think, four, four sons in that family. I think about all of them were at least one or two time national champ. There has to be within the homes the desire to be together. And it has to be a priority. In the uh, Second chapter of Jacob. The Nephites had become very successful, I guess you'd say. But be, as they, as that happened, they began to be, be more worldly. 
and more prideful. And they began, sounds a lot like our society today, they began to be involved in adulterous relationships. And this is the word of uh, a servant of God to these men. Ye have broken the hearts of your tender wives, and you've lost the confidence of your children because of your bad examples before them. And the sobbing of their hearts ascend up to God against you. And the only way that that can be overcome in the life of any individual is through repentance. Repentance is not a bad word. Repentance is turning from that which is wrong to that which is good. It's a turnaround of our lives. And he says, look unto God with firmness of mind. Pray unto him with exceeding faith, and he will console you in your afflictions, and he will plead your cause, and he will send down justice upon those who seek your destruction. O oh, all ye that are pure in heart, lift up your heads and receive the pleasing word of God, and feast upon his love, for you may, if your minds are firm forever. You know, the Apostle Paul talks about the scriptures being given for our good. And we also have recorded in the book of Mosiah, for we have been taught in the language of the Egyptians, therefore we could read these engravings and teach them to his children, that thereby they could teach them to their children, and thus fulfill the commandments of God. Even down to this present age, I say unto you, my sons, were it not for these things which have been kept and preserved by the hand of God, that we might read and that we might understand his mysteries and have his commandments always before our eyes, that even our fathers would have dwindled in unbelief. How important it is that we cherish and we pass on from generation to generation the Word of God. And this, this idea is passed on throughout all of the scriptures. In uh, Genesis, uh, out of the inspired version, I have given you another law and commandment, wherefore teach it unto your children, that all men everywhere must repent, or they cannot, can in no wise inherit the kingdom of God. For no unclean thing can dwell there or dwell in his presence. Therefore, I give a commandment to teach these things freely unto your children, saying that by reason of transgression cometh the fall, which bringeth death. And inasmuch as they were born into the world by water and blood and the spirit, which I have made and so become the dust of a living soul, even so ye must be born again into the kingdom of heaven, of water, and of the spirit, and be cleansed by the blood, the blood of mine only begotten, yea, that you might be sanctified from all sin, and that you might enjoy the words of eternal life in this world and the world to come. You don't have to wait till you get on the other side to enjoy the words of eternal life and feast upon them and grow and grow into the knowledge of God and grow in your desires to keep his commandments and grow in your countenance that his image might be within you. For by the water you keep the commandments, and by the Spirit you are justified, and by the blood ye are sanctified. And we can go um, throughout Scripture and find the, the 
in the very beginning, the idea was taught to the patriarchs, to Adam, to Abraham, uh, Noah, all of these great men of the Old Testament. And thou shalt teach these things diligently unto thy children. And thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. How many of you have ever been to the capital, either the national capital or, or at Jefferson? And what do you find written on the walls there? Scripture. Our forefathers that we've sang about this morning wrote upon the walls their beliefs so that all might see the source and the strength of this mighty nation. And as it, the people responded to the word of God, this nation grew and it prospered and it was saved from all the wars that are, have taken place overseas, World War I, World War II, and so on. But now the day has come when we have to cry repentance to this nation, that they might not have to suffer the consequences of being disobedient to the word of God. Many of the things which are transpiring in this nation are the same things that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed for. And if God is unchangeable, and this nation doesn't repent, it can expect the same kind of judgments to come upon it. Oh, how important it is that we teach our children the word of God. That they might diligently follow his commandments and keep his laws. As the, as the prayers on the communion say. That they might have his spirit to be with them. I remember talking to a young lady several years ago. And she made this statement. She came from a rougher home. Her fa father didn't have much to do with the, the kids. And she made this statement. If I can't trust my earthly father, how am I ever going to learn to trust my heavenly father? Many of your children, as was mentioned in class, see our Heavenly Father by the things that their earthly father has done. If the earthly father is diligent, faithful, keeps the commandments, is gentle, kind, disciplined, there's a, a lot of different aspects to fatherhood. And it's sad to say, I have found out, you can be strong in one and weak in another area. But that's not what the Lord desires. He desires that we might be strong in all areas of our life. And that every area of our life might represent him. I like a scripture that's in Genesis. All things were created to testify of him. If that's true of the the seasons and the trees and the, the going dormant and, and coming back alive, shouldn't it also be true of the fathers of the kingdom that they testify of him? I've heard Alberta talk about her father. I've heard Jerry talk about her father. Fathers, you can have a great impact upon the lives of your children. And if you think it's too late... My father was inactive when, when they first got married, and we grew up in the Lutheran church. 
But the pastor would drive by our place, the RLDS pastor, and Dad would feel guilty. So he went, went and started doing his chores earlier in the morning so he wouldn't be out there when the pastor drove by. Well, what happened was then he would go in and he began to read the Book of Mormon. And we came home, and we would see tears coming down his eyes as the Spirit of the Lord was moving up on him in a mighty way. And what I want to testify to those of you that might feel that you have failed, the transformation that took place in my father's life has had a tremendous impact on me and my two brothers. None of us would be gathered today if the Spirit of God hadn't moved upon him to get his life in order and to listen to the voice of the Spirit and to move out accordingly. I challenge each of you fathers that the ministry which you have to perform is not finished. Those of you that will be fathers, prepare yourself for fatherhood, that you might be good and righteous men that can bear testimony of him. For the calling today to the saints and particularly to the you men is to rise up. We've lived in a society that has downplayed the role of men for way too long in their families. And the emphasis is upon those things which are more worldly. I say unto you, repent and call upon God that you might walk as his servants before the peoples of this world, but particularly the peoples of this community, that they might see by your walk that you're a servant of the Lord Jesus. Almighty God, we have come to honor you. We have received the good word.
Now let us go forth. To take time to be holy. To show the world we are your children. We follow thee. Bless us to this end. Heavenly Father that we may show others that we belong to thee and we know thy word and we live this life for thee. We thank you for this hour of worship that we can praise your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>